wonderful to be with you this morning. I do have some connections with your congregation, both Karen and I do. Uh, for example, uh, LaVon and Bev come up and visit us quite a bit when uh, they don't visit us, they visit Phil and Cindy and their lovely granddaughter, Lily. And uh, so I, and, and as was mentioned, we got to know Pastor Matt and Rod and Betty when we were in Israel a couple of years ago. But I got to tell one on Rod. Um, now, now, Rod and Betty and Karen, you can correct me if I'm wrong here. I don't want to get, I want to get my facts straight. But as we were standing in the line to come home at the airport, um, the, uh, the a gentleman came up and asked me to trade passports with Rod. And, uh, and then he saw Matt. <laughs> He said, no, I want you to trade with him. And, and what he was doing was he was testing his people. He was a supervisor testing the people who were looking at the passports. And so Rod and Matt both went up, each had the other's passport, and the poor girl failed the test. And they pulled her off the line. So, but uh, I, I remember at the time thinking, why do you want us to trade passports? But anyway, it's, it's good to be here with you this morning. Uh, it's a blessing to get to know some of you. And it's certainly a blessing to know, you know, Rod and Betty, and to know LaVon and Bev, and they're beautiful people. And thank you for putting us up last night. The Gospels tell us that Jesus taught the people in parables. Now parables are simple stories about things familiar to the audience that contain important spiritual truths. Now this morning I'm going to do something a little different in this sermon. I'm going to share two parables about things that I know are familiar to you. The first is a parable about plowing, and the second is a parable about planting. I take my first parable from our text where Jesus invites us to take up his yoke. I like the way this passage is translated in a translation called the Kingdom New Testament. It says, are you having a real struggle? Come to me. Are you carrying a big load on your back? Come to me. I'll give you a rest. Pick up my yoke and put it on. Take lessons from me. My heart is gentle, not arrogant. You'll find the rest you deeply need. My yoke is easy to wear. My load is easy to bear. In Jesus' day, and indeed as it still is some, in some third world countries today, a large wooden beam called a yoke was fastened to the shoulders of an ox to plow the fields. For this reason, I call my first parable the young ox and his, and his yoke. A farmer once placed a yoke upon the shoulders of a young and untried ox, and with the stinging crack of a whip across the animal's back, he drove him into the unplowed field. The yoke was made of wood, heavy and rough, and with each step it chafed against the young ox's skin. Yet every time he struggled and strained against it, he was treated to another sharp bite of his master's whip. Attached to the yoke was an old plow so rusty and bent that it dug only grudgingly into the unbroken soil. As the young ox struggled forward, the pain of the heavy yoke and the master's lash and the drag of the old plow became so difficult that it took all of his strength to keep going. The sun was hot, and he wondered how he could possibly bear this burden to the end of the day. Somehow, though, he made it to day's end, and was led into the shelter of the barn. But there he dropped to the floor from sheer exhaustion and immediately fell asleep. But it was a fitful sleep, filled with dreams that he was in the field beneath the scorching sun, pulling with all his might at a burden so heavy that he couldn't budge it, even though his master laid lash after painful lash upon his back. The following morning, the young ox awoke full of dread for he knew he was facing another day of pain and struggle and toil. But when he looked up, his eyes opened wide with surprise, for there towering above him stood a stronger, more mature ox. Beside this magnificent ox lay a double yoke constructed of a smoother, lighter wood. And attached to the yoke was a new plow with a sharp and shiny steel blade that reflected the sun's rays in a dazzling spray of light. The farmer placed the new yoke on the two oxen, and the young ox was pleasantly surprised to find that it lay comfortably upon his shoulders. The older ox, to whom he was now yoked, looked at him with gentle eyes as if to say, don't be discouraged, little one. This new yoke is light and easy to wear. 
and I will be pulling right, pulling right next to you, using my superior strength to bear the greater part of the burden. Well, on this day, the farmer had no need to lash the oxen into the motion because the older ox stepped confidently out into the field, prompting the younger one to fall into lockstep beside him. All day long, the two oxen walked, almost effortlessly it seemed to the young ox, back and forth across the field. The dark, fertile soil surrendered easily to the shiny new blade of the plow. And every time the young ox began to stray, the older one guided him gently back onto the path. The day was long, but the companionship of the older ox made it seem to go by quickly. When evening fell, the young ox was weary, but with a weariness that comes from a hard day's work well done. That night he slept soundly, dreaming that the older, stronger ox was pulling right beside him, bearing the greater part of the burden and gently guiding him so that together they plowed the furrows straight and true. Have you ever felt like that young ox? With a yoke of burdens that seem too heavy to bear? Of course you have. And so have I. Some of these burdens are simply due to the fact that we live in a fallen world where bad things happen to good people. Christians are persecuted. Crops sometimes fail. Tornadoes and floods ravage whole communities. Time and age rob our loved ones of memories. And death takes those we love, both old and young. Even as followers of Christ, and sometimes because we are followers of Christ, we all face heartbreaking burdens that seem impossible to bear. But the burdens that are not of our own making, the ones that just come to us as a matter of our lives, as difficult and as heartbreaking as they may be, as often as not, serve to bind husbands and wives, neighbors and church members closer together in shared grief and in loving care. But the heavier burdens are the ones we bring upon ourselves. The burden of egotism, of prideful one-upsmanship with our spouse. I've seen it happen. I've done it <laughs> before. A neighbor or another church member. The burden of a quick temper and harsh words that irreparably wound others. Or the burden of being the center of your own universe, where you place value on people and things only if they are pleasing or useful to you. These are burdens of the worst kind, for they don't bind together, they tear apart, resulting in failing marriages, alienated relationships, and conflict in our homes, our communities, and our churches. It's comforting to read Jesus' invitation to take up his yoke as an offer to help us carry the burdens of our lives. And while this is certainly true, that is not what the text is saying. For Jesus doesn't offer to take up our yoke and our burden. Rather, he invites each one of us to lay down the yoke that fixes us to our own burdens, so difficult and discouraging and exhausting to bear, and to take up a new yoke, his yoke, and a new burden, his burden, a burden that is easy to bear. A number of years ago, my pastor asked me to pay a hospital visit, and this was before I was a pastor, to pay a hospital visit to a man from our congregation who was dying of cancer. I was reluctant to do so because I felt that his request placed an unreasonable burden on my time and, and I cringed at the thought of sitting and making small talk with a man I barely knew whose body was wasting away from disease. But I knew it was the Christian thing to do, so I agreed. Now my first visit was a little awkward because I barely knew him and we seemed to have little in common to talk about. But out of a sense of Christian duty, I came back the next day and then the next, and soon I was visiting him on a regular basis. It wasn't long before my burden of duty was transformed into a burden of love for this man and a desire to spend time with him. He died within a short time after I began visiting him, and by that time I had become so close to him that I genuinely grieved his loss. However, this man whom I barely knew a few weeks earlier left me one last gift. He chose me to help bear his coffin to its final resting place. From a worldly point of view, Jesus' burden seems difficult, nearly impossible to bear because it stands in opposition to everything our culture and our fallen natures value and seek after, pleasure, self-gratification, a life free of trouble and toil. But it's the very burden our Heavenly Father created the human spirit to bear, the burden of self-sacrifice that calls us to lose our lives in service to others so that we might find a higher life in Christ. 
the burdens of love, grace, and forgiveness that resolve conflicts, heal hurts, and mend broken relationships. It's an invitation to abandon our self-centered concerns, to refuse to allow worldly troubles and turmoil to plague our spirits, and to surrender our lives to his gentle, humble spirit that we might find rest for our souls, even in the midst of the world's troubles. Now, of course, after the plowing comes the planting, right? You, you all know that. In Matthew 13, Jesus tells a parable about planting. This parable is about a field sown with seeds strewn about, strewn about upon four different types of soil. The first was a hard soil, which the seeds could not penetrate, and the birds came and carried the seeds away. The second was a rocky soil. Now, incidentally, this is not a soil with rocks in it, but it's a thin veneer of soil laying over solid rock, which was common in many parts of Palestine. A soil in which the seed sprouted but soon died because its roots could not reach below the solid rock. The third was a soil filled with thorny weeds that choke out the good seed, soak up the rains, and complete, compete for the nourishment of the soil so that the fruit produced is small and weak. And then there's the good soil, where the seed germinates and grows into healthy stalks that produce abundant fruit, as much as a hundred times the original seed sown. Now Jesus' disciples were perplexed about this parable. So they came and asked him what it meant. He explained to them that the seed is the good news or the gospel of the kingdom of heaven. And the soil is the human heart, the very center of our being where our thoughts, our wills, and our emotions reside. Jesus tells his disciples that the hard soil is the hardened heart, which the seeds of God's word cannot penetrate, and Satan comes and snatches God's word away. He tells them that the rocky soil is the heart in which God is, the word of God is accepted gladly and begins to grow, but because the soil of the heart is shallow and lies upon the hard rock of trouble and temptation, it soon withers and dies. But I want to focus our attention on the thorny and the good soils. Reading once again from the Kingdom New Testament in Matthew 13, 22 and 23, Jesus tells his disciples, The seed sown among thorns is the one who hears the word, but the world's worries and the seduction of wealth choke out the word and it doesn't bear much fruit. But the seed sown in good soil is the one who hears the word and understands it. Someone like that will bear fruit. One will produce a hundred times over, another sixty, and another thirty times over. My second parable is, in essence, a retelling of Jesus' parable of the thorny and the good soils. The field has been plowed, and the farmer now walks the length and the breadth of the field. He pulls handfuls of seed, which he scatters in abundance of the field, on the field, out of a bag across his shoulders. He repeats this process again and again until the bag is empty and the entire field is sown. The farmer has planted, trusting that the rains will come, the shoots will break through their hard outer shell, and new life will spring abundantly forth and grow into hardy, healthy stalks laden with ripening grain. But as the seed begins to grow, the farmer notices that something is terribly wrong. Half of his field is carpeted with healthy, growing stalks that will soon mature and produce an abundant harvest. However, in the other half, an enemy has come under the cover of darkness and sown thorny sealed seeds among the, of the grain. Although the seeds of grain send shoots up through the soil, the weeds drink up much of the precious rainfall and compete for the nutrition in the soil, and the young shoots of grain grow, but they're weak and their fruit is small and sparse. Oh, well, let me ask you a question. Would you rather have your field look like this or like this? That's a rhetorical question, incidentally. I grew up in a farming community much like this one, and from the time I can remember, the term musk thistle was a dirty word. I remember seeing vacant lots and fallow fields filled with their thorny leaves and their purple flowers, some standing several feet tall. They were, and I assume they still are, a noxious weed that the state of Nebraska says must be controlled. <laughs> Good. I'm glad to hear that. Because <laughs> we've got one growing in our yard. <laughs> we do. <laughs> I suspect that for most of us, and I'm talking about myself as much as anyone, that it wouldn't be one or the other. It would be a mixture. It would be a mixture of faith with doubt and worry, of hope mixed with deep disappointments that plague our spirits, of love mixed with self-centered concerns, 
And so the issue is not, will the thistles come among the stalks of grain, but which will we allow to predominate? Which will we seek to cultivate and grow, and which will we seek to weed out and eradicate? Notice that in Jesus' parable, the seeds in both the thorny and the good fields grew and produced fruit, but there was a significant difference in the quality and quantity of fruit produced. The stalk in the thorny soil was spindly and produced only a small crop of inferior fruit, whereas the stalk in the good soil grew strong and flourished and produced a crop of superior fruit. Now these two soils represent Christians whose hearts the Word of God has penetrated. The difference is that the heart choked by the thorns of worldly worry and the seduction of worldly treasures and pleasures compromise the ability of the Holy Spirit to grow us into healthy, abundant bearers of His fruit. And so we produce a small crop of spindly fruit, while the Christian who keeps his or her heart clean and free by studying and living God's Word and through prayer will produce an abundant crop of Holy Spirit-filled fruit. So I ask again, which of these soils will your heart cultivate? cultivate? A question covenanters often asked one another in the very early days was, how is it with your walk? This is a very important question, but one, unfortunately, that we rarely ask ourselves or ask one another anymore. However, it's essential in our walk with Christ that we be intentional about examining ourselves and asking Jesus, how is it with my heart, Lord? Is the soil of my heart free to receive the seed of your word and nourish it to full maturity and abundant fruitfulness? Or are the noxious weeds of self-centeredness, worry, and the seduction of wealth and material treasures weakening the seed of your word in my heart? and rendering the fruit of my life spindly and small. Planting and plowing, the yoke and the seed. Each of these parables teaches essentially the same lesson in its own way. The parable of the yoke asks, how is it with your life? Is it being dragged down and worn to death by burdens too heavy to bear? If so, lay down your yoke of worldly burdens and self-centered concerns. Take up the gentle yoke and the life-giving burden of Christ, and you'll find rest for your souls. The parable of the seed asks, how is it with your heart? Is it filled with the thorny weeds of worldly concerns and seductions that are choking the life of the seed of God's word out of you? Or is the soil of your soul rich and free so that the word of God is growing healthy and strong in the life-giving reins of the Holy Spirit, producing an abundance of spirit-filled fruit? Jesus' parables about the yoke and the seed are countercultural. They're revolutionary even. They speak against everything the world values and after which it runs. Wealth, power, pleasure, material comfort, and a trouble-free life. Yet far too often, we who call ourselves followers of Christ allow ourselves to be dragged down and rendered unfruitful by burdens of worry and the seductions of the world. Our culture is big into self-awareness, but it is self-surrender to Christ and His Word not more awareness of what lies in our own sin-sick souls. That is the true path to the eternal kind of life. If we would bear abundant fruit for the kingdom of God, we must let go of the burdens of self that choke the life out of his life in us and render us unfruitful. We must put off the yoke of struggle to become or to overcome that which we, in our own wisdom and strength, cannot become, knowing that Christ, our older brother, has borne the greater part of our burdens on the yoke of the cross. We must prepare the soil of our hearts to receive the good seed of the gospel in all its fullness by spending time with God in study, prayer, and worship, and by living out the great commandment to love God first and our neighbors as ourselves. If we do these things, our lives will bloom with the beauty of Christ, and they will abundantly bear the fruit of the Holy Spirit, and we will discover that rather than being a greater burden, Jesus' yoke is indeed easy to wear, and his burden is easy to bear. In closing, I would like you to pray with me the prayer that will be up on the screen there. Let's pray it together. Lord Jesus, we accept the invitation to take up your yoke, that we may be guided by you, learn from you, and walk through this life with you. Give us grace to bear your burden of faith, hope, and love in and for the world. Keep the soil of our hearts fertile for your word, free of the worries of this fallen world, 
and the seduction of wealth and power that our culture idolizes. Grant that we may receive the seed of your word gladly and bear much fruit for your kingdom. For we know that this is the eternal kind of life to which you call us, the only kind of life that will lead us to an eternity of life with you. Thank you, blessed Lord, for this blessed life. Amen.